Hey everyone, welcome back to Lunch on the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host here every week, and I'm a filmmaker that's been working with CCF for almost 10 years, a decade, folks. I can't believe it. It's 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 flown by, and then in some ways it feels like it, it, it's 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 been 10 years. It's been a while, but I really, really enjoy being a part of this community and doing the work that I do with CCF. And what that is, is to create video series, video content. Sometimes it's a live series like this, and sometimes it's produced videos uh, as well, but they both are trying to achieve the same mission, which is CCF's mission to, to raise awareness and education about, about neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine cancer. So if you are new, let us know where you're signing on from in the world. We'd love to see how far these programs reach. And if you're a regular, you've probably already already doing that because you know the drill. And I see that we are good morning from Wisconsin, SoCal, a couple people from Wisconsin. Um, so we have, as you can probably already tell, uh, a very unique episode today. Before we get started and I introduce this unique episode, we uh, we want to take a moment to thank Tercera Therapeutics uh, for their support of Lunch with the Experts. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. And we always like to say a disclaimer from them at the top of the program. The opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts. And CCF does not endorse, promote any of the views, opinions, or information in the presentation. Audience members again, that's you all at home, should not rely solely on the opinions or informa information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay, anytime it's, uh, there's a disclaimer, it, it tends to get wordy, but the last sentence there is really the takeaway. We're gonna give you some advice. We're gonna help you. That's the goal of this program but we don't know your specific case. And by all means, we don't make, want to make you uh, rush to any decisions. Take this information back to your home team, discuss it with them because they know your specific case. That is the takeaway there. Okay, so today, if you couldn't tell, we have not one, not two, but three special guests. Um, we're going to start with Dr. Herbert Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you work, how you fit into the neuroendocrine tumor community, and then let's introduce uh, part of your team that are joining us today. Thank you, Rain. It's great to be here today. Um, and so, as you said, I'm, my name's Herb Chen. I am an endocrine surgeon, and I've been in the neuroendocrine sphere for my gosh, well over 20 years now. I uh, began my career at the University of Wisconsin where I uh, started to both develop an interest not only in taking care of patients with neuroendocrine um, cancer, but also doing a lot of research in the field. And we started our neuroendocrine research group there at Wisconsin and about five years ago, a little over five years, uh, I moved to the University of Alabama at Birmingham, UAB, to be the chair of the Department of Surgery. But also what was so attractive about this move is to be able to build not only a Department of Surgery, but a neuroendocrine research team uh, to hopefully advance research in the area and to get more people into the space doing research. And so I thought it would be fantastic to also include members of our overall team who are driving that research and clinical mission. And I will uh, let Renata introduce herself, but Renata and I have been working together for um, 17 years, Renata. Yeah, almost, yeah. And so why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your neuroendocrine uh, cancer journey and what brought you to, uh, what brought your interest to, in the area? Um, so I'm Renata Shu, and uh, as Dr. Chen mentioned, I have been working with Dr. Chen on um, and basic uh, research on neuroendocrine cancer almost 17 years. So we started uh, working together in Wisconsin and moved five years ago to, to Alabama. We continue to look for um, therapeutics and uh, new therapies for neuroendocrine cancer. Great, thanks, Renata. And then uh, another member of our team is Bart Rose, and I'll let Bart introduce himself. Hi, I'm Bart Rose. I am a liver and pancreas surgeon here at the University of Alabama. Um, I've been here about three years now, uh, originally from California, and I, I came down here to work with Herb, and he just had such an outstanding reputation. Um, 
that it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. And we've been working together since. Uh, we have uh, we work in the lab together and also clinically. I run the um, pancreas center here and uh, as well as help with um, care of all of our neuroendocrine patients. Awesome. Uh, so folks, uh, go ahead and start sending in your questions. But as you know, now we're really talking about, and, and Dr. Chen and I were talking about this before we got started. Um, this specialty, what's so unique about this program is, is we have a research team here. And so we're going to try to talk as much as we can about that today. Uh, Dr. Chen, are there, are there any areas that you feel like this team is going to be most um, you know, prepared to, to help people with today? Any certain topics that you think would, would, would be best? Well, I think that obviously we're happy to answer any questions about sure. neuroendocrine, um, but I think particularly for the, for the group of people we've assembled here, you know, all of us have been uh, funded or are funded extensively by the National Institutes of Health, NIH, to study neuroendocrine cancer. You know, one of the limitations we've had in the field overall uh, is the research. And I sort of recognize this 20 years ago is there were, at that time, there was hardly anyone doing research on neuroendocrine cancer. Right. We spent a lot of time convincing both foundations and the government, the NIH, that that is a deficiency and we need to get more uh, money to have this research funded and we need more people to apply for NIH grants and stuff. And I think over the last two decades, we've been pretty successful at getting the number of people, researchers interested in the field and interested to devote their time and energies to study, you know, a cancer that we're all devoted to now. And I think what's so unique about the people on the call today is they have been able to successfully build programs, apply for grants from the NIH and the NIH recognizes their work as having potential to make an impact for patients. So I think the expertise that this group brings is sort of recognizing what's on the cutting edge and what is potentially going to be things that we can utilize in the future. Because we understand, although we have some, some good therapies available for neuroendocrine cancer, and obviously as a surgeon, I'm biased because surgery is the main uh, therapy. But for those who can't have a complete um, surgical cure or a complete resection, we, we have to find other ways that are effective to stop the either tumor from spreading or to even obviously reduce tumor burden, reduce um, symptoms from um, hormone secretion and all those things. And our, our research is really geared towards uh, trans the translational part. And when I say translational, not only just studying the science of the cancer, but to think of a way we can exploit that knowledge to develop a treatment Mm -hmm. translate that from the lab, what we say actually from the bench to the bedside. Yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> and really, that's what we're all about. And when we think, uh, we just had our lab meeting yesterday, all of us. So when we're thinking about experiments, thinking about where we devote our energies, we are thinking about how can this make a different difference for a patient? Absolutely. Um, so everybody, we just we want to give you the best opportunity to help you this 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 show. The reason why we do this week in and week out is for you. So just wanted to lay that little bit of groundwork so that you can optimize this time and get the most out of it. You have a really unique opportunity here, here to talk to people who know what's happening on the cutting edge. And listen, I know this is a problem that you all struggle with because every week we get questions about, you know, what's next? Are there any new treatments? I've tried this, I've tried that. So I think this is going to be a really good episode for you all. Uh, so stick around. And also, if you know anyone who would benefit from this, okay, the video will live here. You can always refer back to it. But this interactiveness is really what is the selling point about lunching with the, with the experts, getting a question across, having a virtual one-on-one -on -one session. So if you know someone that would benefit from this, you can tag them in the comments. You can also share this video to their pro, uh, Facebook profile and get many, more people in here so that, that we can extend the benefit to them as well. So go ahead and start sending in your questions now that you know a little bit about our specialists and our experts today. And then there's one more thing that I'm going to say uh, or ask from you besides sharing this. And, and you, you all have been doing a great job of this every week. So I want to continue to ask it. 
when you see, you know, we're not going to be able to get to everybody's questions because you all have a lot of questions and we only have a, a limited amount of time. So if you see a question in the sidebar in the comment section that you also have or you're also interested in or would like to know more about, you can like that. You can just click like or love. There's several different reactions you can choose and any of them will, will work for me. But what it does is as I'm scrolling through the comments, I see that, hey, oh, five other people had this question and I'll make sure that I get it across. Uh, just it's kind of like a, a system where it upvotes it and allows me, it kind of rises to the top so I can make sure that uh, I get, get that question across because there's a demand. And so finally, before we get started, we wanted to ask, have you downloaded CCF's free net cancer health storylines app this app is amazing it makes it easy to record your symptoms your medications nutritional concerns moods and, and everything else so if you haven't checked it out do that now we'll put a link in the comments and that being said if there's any other resources that our guests uh, refer to today blogs uh, you know uh, medications anything like that that would require you to to start a new link or a new uh, new tab in your browser and, and seek that out. We're going to put that in the comments and make that easy for you so you don't have to be toggling back and forth. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and start taking some questions. Everybody ready? <laughs> oh, and Renata, by the way, I did get a couple of feedback saying that there was uh, your microphone was a little bit quiet. I'm not sure if you can adjust that on your end or maybe scoot a little closer, but just as a, as a heads up as we move along, um, or, you, or you can holler at us if you need to. Um, but uh, we already have a question that has been upvoted by five people. So apparently we, a lot of people have this question. This comes from John and John says, okay, perhaps this is a, a bit like asking you if you found the Holy Grail, uh, but any news about possible causes of nets? I know this is one that, that comes up a lot or whether there are any possible lifestyle dietary changes that might discourage uh, metastases. So I know that's a big one, but I think that's a good one to, to, to start with. Any thoughts on that team? Mark, do you want to, you have some views? I have some views, but. Yeah, I, well, you know, I don't think we've, um, we know that there's certain genetic syndromes are associated with it, but as far as, as what we consider to be uh, sporadic or, or not associated with genetic syndromes, um, I don't think we have really strong dietary or, or lifestyle triggers for this. And so unfortunately, I don't think there's, there's not a lot there. Uh, we, we do have some experimental models that are shedding some new insight on what some of the, the underlying changes within the cell that might be causing that are. And I, maybe that's what Herb wants to talk about a little bit. Um, so I might defer to him on that. Well, you probably guessed what, how I would comment on that is that, you know, I agree with you. It's that we have not found the holy grail of what causes sporadic neuroendocrine cancers. As we know, part of the difficulty is that you know, the group of neuroendocrine cancer is so broad, right? There, they are a number of tumors that form throughout in multiple organs in the body and have all sorts of varying behaviors to the ones that are a little more inland to those very aggressive. Um, but one of the things that we have studied, and I know that both you and Renata are also invested because we have studied the, the notch signaling pathway which is a pathway we believe is very important in the progression of neuroendocrine cancer. And that's why our most recent research efforts have focused on ways to sort of target that pathway in the hopes of either slowing progression, preventing metastases or slowing or potentially treating metastases. And that is a, a focus of a recent grant submission that we have had it is the that's actually a lot of your work part, right? Is understanding the role of notch three in that paradigm. That's right. Yeah. So I think you know there's in the notch pathway, and there's a number of other researchers that are looking at different pathways and exactly how they interact with each other. We're we're still trying to figure out, um, but we I don't think we have a good understanding of why these diff these things that are normally behaving themselves decide not to. And whether that's something, an environmental trigger or a dietary trigger or just, you know, bad luck, um, I don't think we really know yet. Got it. All right. Thanks for your question. Hopefully that helps. Next question, we'll move on from Tara. Uh, Tara or Tara, depends on where you're, where you're from. Uh, have you seen any correlation in patients or, or families that have, ha that have both adrenal gland cancer and neuroendocrine cancers in, in their family? 
Is this something common from, from your experience? Uh, yeah, so there, there, there are a number of genetic syndromes that do link those together. Um, and it, there, neuroendocrine tumors can really arise in any part of the body. Uh, and there are certain syndromes that link these different lesions together. So I think if you have family members that have had neuroendocrine tumors in different parts of the body, uh, that it's important to talk with a geneticist. They'll do a detailed family history. And then um, if they think that the risk is high enough, they'll either have you do a saliva collection kit or some type of blood selection uh, collection kit. And they'll look for what's something called a germline mutation or a mutation that may uh, be passed down from, from family member to family member. Um, but having multiple family members, immediate family members, mom, dad, brothers, sisters that have neuroendocrine tumors of any type, uh, the more of those there are in a family, it becomes very, very suspicious uh, that there is a, a genetic link to this. Got it. Thanks for your question, uh, Tara. So um, I have a question from Dorothy that a lot of people do have, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, pose it. Um, just a reminder, everybody, and you don't have to stick to, to this, but um, we have a, a specialist research team here today, so we're, we're kind of focusing on, on that topic. Uh, but Dorothy says, if your serotonin levels are, are, are high, does that always mean that your liver is involved with disease or can it come from another source? Yeah, uh, it, it is It is more likely that you have liver disease, but not 100%. And, and those, what is, there's different levels of high and they don't necessarily correlate with how much disease you have. Things that you eat can make it elevated. Um, we, we will often uh, confirm, not just looking at serotonin levels in the blood, but the breakdown product of serotonin in the urine, something called 5-HIAA. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll give you this big, milk jug and ask you to collect all your pee for 24 hours and then we'll look for that chemical level but even those tests can can have what we call false positives meaning that it'll be high even though it's not really and that may be something related to what you ate or another medication that you're on um, so the short answer is no it doesn't always have to be uh, liver disease got it Thanks, Dorothy. Um, so Linda says, are there any new approaches in the works for addressing carcinoid syndrome? This is something that a lot of patients struggle with. A lot of questions come across for this program. Any, any new work that's being done in, in that vein? Yeah, I think the most recent FDA approved drugs are Zarmelo. And I think that's helped a lot of people with uh, some, their, when diet, diarrhea is their predominant symptom. Um, but the backbone of the uh, somatostatin analogs, octreotide, lanreotide, are still really uh, what we base things around. And then the symptom control uh, with Zarmelo. Um, as far as basic science research looking into that, I think um, Renata probably has, a, has some insights into that. So we are testing um, uh, somatostatin analogs. So again, uh, octreotide uh, and lanreotide. Um, and um, I think still those uh, somatostatin analogs are the main ones um, to reduce carcinoid syndrome. Uh, we were trying to conjugate those analogs with different drugs and, and um, antibodies, uh, but still uh, the main um, effect comes from uh, somatostatin analogs, so octreotides mainly. And I'll just comment on Part of Renata's work is actually looking at exploiting somatostatin receptors and also trying to make uh, somatostatin analogs, both medication and also the uh, radioisotope um, treatment, uh, Ludothera, more effective and basically uh, allow more patients to be eligible for it by trying to upregulate or change these somatostatin receptors that are present on most uh, neuroendocrine cancers. Is that right, Renata? Yes, so what we found that um, um, some compounds which are already approved for, for um, different disease can upregulate somatostatin receptors in patients who have very low um, level of SSTR2 and um, then uh, after overexpression of receptors, those patients um, are eligible for uh, lutathera or um, therapy or dotapate imaging. Um, so then um, 
it becomes um, a therapy for, for patients who are not eligible um, um, for those treatments. Yeah, and, and, and we're talking a lot about these things called somatostatin receptors. And for maybe uh, some of the audience who, who is unfamiliar with those terms, these neuroendocrine tumors, um, one of their unique features is they have this chemical on the outside um, called a somatostatin receptor uh, that is in a lot of cells in our body, but for some reason, neuroendocrine tumors have a lot more of them. And we can exploit that for therapy. So, you know, if you can think about this as kind of a lock and a key, if the somatostatin receptor is the lock, then the key is the octreotide or something like that, and they fit together really well. And Renata has found a way to make more of these locks on the surface for, so you can get more keys to them and increase your treatment efficiency. And so I think this is, a, is really exciting, the work that she's doing. That is, that is exciting. Uh, we had a question from Perry actually about uh, Ludothera, which you had brought up, Renata. So he says, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, bega- I'm about to begin Ludothera treatment after five injections of lanreotide that did not work well. How well can I expect Ludothera to work or what can I expect from it? So I think the, the first, um, probably, uh, you will have um, Dr. Tate imaging. So um, first, um, you will have detection of, of uh, tumors. And the next step will be uh, treatment with Rutatera. So if um, detection will be successful, uh, the next step will be treatment. And then both Dotatate as Rutatera are uh, targeting the same receptors. So if um, imaging will confirm that you are positive for SSTR2 receptors, then um, I think this will be the green light for, for Rutatera treatment. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you, Perry, for your question. Um, what are you all focused on? Like, let me figure out how I want to pose this. I, mean, I want to say, how, what are you excited about? But is there a certain area of research that you're focused on that would really be the key to, or the, the, the domino to knock down the other ones, if you, if you understand what I'm saying? Like, and that might be too broad, but like, is there something that's like that? Like if we could just figure this out, it would really help the challenges that we're currently facing. I know we've made such tremendous strides in the past 10 years. What are we trying to unlock in the next 10 years? I think the main feature of neuroendocrine tumors are uh, metastatic potential. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of models, preclinical models uh, to test different compounds, drugs, nanoparticles, antibody drug conjugates, um, uh, to prevent uh, creation of liver metastasis. So I think that um, it is what we are trying to, to explore uh, and, and will be exploring for, for another few years. So, so if I understand correctly, like the goal would be to like, if we can contain it, it'd yes, be a lot- prevent, prevent metastasis. Yeah, and we can contain it, it'd be a lot easier to, to manage. Yeah. yeah. Mark? Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I have some ideas, but go ahead and tell, tell me your uh, thoughts, and then I'll tell you mine. So I think there's there's two kind of um, ways to to attack it, and I think the biggest thing for any cancer it, that drives um, how significant of an impact it's going to have on a patient is what stage you find it in, right? So if if you don't find the cancer uh, until it's spread to other organs then you're kind of playing catch up, right? So just like most cancers, if we can catch this earlier, you're going to do better. And so having some sort of screening or ability to detect this by blood work would be huge. Um, and that's, the, that's just the case with cancer across the board. Um, then, then the next thing is, well, if you weren't able to do that and you have caught it at a later stage, then more effective treatments and I'm you know, very excited about immunotherapy, uh, which has not shown any success for neuroendocrine tumors. Um, but I think that there are ways that potentially we could increase that um, and, and maybe make it work. And, and then you're relying on your, your body to uh, respond to the cancer. Uh, and our bodies are, are much smarter um, than we are. So I think harnessing that potential is gonna be huge. Yeah, I think that why I think neuroendocrine cancers can be particularly challenging is that a lot of the strides we've made in treating many different types of cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, and, you know, even, you know, pancreas cancer, 
is because we've been able to find you know, successful chemotherapies or in some cases immunotherapies, which the tumors are, uh, are sensitive to. But for neuroendocrine cancers, um, we've been challenged because we've not really found any at least drug or compounds that effectively can kill neuroendocrine cancer cells or to treat metastases effectively. We have some FDA approved drugs, but they maybe slow the progression a little bit, but they don't result in you know, making, allowing you to live longer if you have the cancer, unlike strides we've made with other cancers. And I think, and this is something that, you know, Renata has heard me talk about a lot, is I think what is challenging about neuroendocrine cancers is that they can, I think somehow they evade, uh, uh, evade therapy, evade the immune system by going dormant or going to a state where they sort of protect themselves from any therapies that we throw at them. And they sort of sit there and many people know that sometimes you have patients with neuronal cancers can have tumors all over the place, but they grow at a very, very slow rate. They're there. And the fact that they don't grow very fast sometimes allows them to evade therapy because a lot of the therapies that we use target rapidly growing cells, right? So if we could understand, and that's some of the work that, we're, that we've gotten into in recent years is what makes these tumors uh, dormant or so hard to um, get at. Um, and if we could figure that out, that would allow us to potentially use some currently available treatments to target them. Um, thank, thanks to you all for that one. And thanks for your question. I have an interesting question from, there's a few people asking about carcinoid syndrome as, as, there, as there always is. This is a big topic for us. But Scott has an interesting question. It says, is there research into the impacts uh, of carcinoid syndrome on mental health? Um, I'll let you all answer that first, but then I think that's an opportunity to talk about a, a bigger topic because I know a lot of people, it, it does impact their mental health. Is there any, any studies being done on that, on like the actual correlation between this, you know, carcinoid syndrome and how it affects their minds? I'm sure there are. And I, you know, I have to admit, I do not know the literature about the mental health research because that's not a space that we are, think about as much. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I would say in general, there is more and more research done looking at that for all types of cancer, as well as survivorship and other things that measure not only mental health, but quality of life, Absolutely. which is in it such an important um, and more and more incorporated in studies when we think about doing any clinical trial or anything translational, we do want to take in consideration a measure of quality of life, which should include uh, mental health as part of it. And in most um, research studies that look at quality of life, mental health is an aspect that's always in most of the instruments that measure quality of life. Uh, Bart, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, it, I think it's a really interesting question that I've had conversations with at different meetings with people who are interested in this. I, I don't know how much work is being done in it, um, in that space, but it is, it's something that we have, as clinicians have definitely recognized. And I think there's, de there's different components that may be contributing to it. Obviously, people, these, these tumors are secreting substances, and some of these substances are the exact same substances that our brain uses to control our moods, um, like serotonin. And so there's obviously, you know, there, there's the potential for having significant amount of these chemicals in your bloodstream for a long time that could be impacting that. And then also one of the things is that this tends to thankfully be a very chronic disease that people have, meaning that it, it, it's not a, a very uh, rapidly lethal cancer for most people. But because of that, because you're having to live with these symptoms for so long, it can take a toll on you mentally. And so I think there's multiple different components that are contributing to this, and it definitely warrants more study. Yeah, I, th I think 
the issue about serotonin uh, in the gut and in the and in the brain is is I wouldn't say it's controversial, but like I just hear a lot of discussion about it. Uh, it seems that I don't know if you were stating that you know you felt that it was definitely connected, but I know there's a lot of interest in that topic, and I've heard varying opinions. I believe is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's fair to say. I don't. I'm not suggesting that the serotonin that's in your bloodstream is crossing the blood-brain barrier. I'm just saying that there there are probably aspects of this that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I've heard but, both. But I would sort of, I mean, what's sort of interesting in, in the moment uh, uh, is that, um, and I'll just tell a brief story. Please. Is I think it's more than, uh, I think it's more than serotonin. I do think that there is a real connection between, you know, neuroendocrine tumors and pathways that control mood and pathways uh, in the brain. And just giving you, you know, example, I'll just uh, uh, work with James Bibb, one of, our, one of another member of our research team here at UAB, who's done some great work, because he he had spent most of his career studying uh, depression, studying um, Alzheimer's, sort of uh, um, uh, diseases of brain malfunction, and. When he was trying to study that, he get a good mouse model of that disease. What he tried to do is uh, manipulate um, a gene, a gene that he studies, it's called CDK5, but manipulate in the brain and change the levels in the brain. And so he tried to create this um, research animal of brain disease and what ended up happening instead of getting an animal brain disease, that uh, animal got neuroendocrine cancer. And that allowed him, I mean, he does work now in neuroendocrine cancer, an area he wasn't going to study, but I mean, his expertise is in these neurologic diseases and mental health. And so I do think that there are distinct pathways, which we're going to find moving forward that play a role in controlling the brain and in neuroendocrine cancers. Yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of similarities between neuroendocrine cells and, and neuronal cells. And a lot of the physiology inside the cell and the receptors and the pathways that are involved are very similar. Um, I did neuroscience research before I went to medical school, and I'm also struck by the similarities too. I studied Alzheimer's and a lot of the processing enzymes or the, the, the processing of these pathways in Alzheimer's is very similar in fact, it's the exact same enzymes uh, linked to Alzheimer's it is to the notch signaling pathways that we're studying now. So I think it's it's just, it seems like there's gotta be more than coincidence there. Mm. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, great great question, spawned a, spawned a nice little conversation in which I'm sure we could talk about a, a lot more, but that's super interesting. And I, and I thought it might be, so I'm glad, I'm glad we got that question from you, Scott. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Linda. We've talked a lot of, uh, today already about um, genetics. And Linda's question is, what is the percentage, if you can put a percentage on it, of patients that have other family members with NETS? And in those cases, is there a primary that's most often seen? For anybody. I, I repeat the beginning of that question. Yeah, well, I don't understand the question. Okay, so. the, the question is, what is the percentage of patients that have family members with NETS, like NET patients with fam that also have family members with NETS, and in those cases, is there a typical or a, a primary that is most often seen in those cases where family members have nets? I see. Uh, yeah, so f inherited, uh, what we call familial neuroendocrine syndromes are, if I remember right, about 5% of neuroendocrine cases, or maybe even less than that. Um, but the primary really depends upon which, which of the syndromes uh, you're, you're responsible or is, is that you're linked to. And I think MEN1 is, is the most common and that's going to be um, pancreatic and um, uh, is going to be the most common presented in that. I think Herb, if you correct me if I'm wrong, but. Yeah, I think that looking at it, it really depends. Um, like for instance, the example for multiple endocrine neoplasia one or MEN1 about uh, people who have that mutation, about 50% will develop a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. But, on, you know, within MEN1, 
it doesn't mean that every single family member will get a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And for some particular reason, only half of them do. And there are other, we believe there are other genetic modifiers. But then you look at another neuroendocrine tumor such as medullary thyroid cancer, which is most commonly a mutation in the RET proto-oncogene. That's very predictable in the sense that, that if you get that gene, there's a 100% chance you are going to get the neuroendocrine tumor. And your neuroendocrine tumor within that family is going to behave very similarly. Um, and then you have like neuroendocrine tumors in the adrenal gland, you know, caused by you know, a whole bunch of variety of other. And again, those tend to be, if you have that same mutation in the family, they tend to behave similarly. So a lot, so it totally depends on the organ that your neuroendocrine cancer forms and it depends upon the particular gene that you have the mutation in. Yeah, and, and then there's this, this phenomenon called penetrance too. And so, you know, you may have either more copies of this mutation than another family member or, but, or for whatever reason, the other genes you inherited from the other side of the family are keeping this at bay. So I have one patient who has what's called an SDHB mutation, and his grandmother had neuroendocrine tumors in her neck, but she didn't get those until she was 70. And I just took his first one out and he's 30. And so his have shown up much earlier than his grandmother did. And we don't really know why, but that's an exam. They should have the exact same mutation, but there's something different about the genes he inherited from the other side of the family. Uh, potentially that are, that are limiting the expression of that, or how that presents and the timing and how aggressive it may be. Got it. Um, are there any new tests, uh, this is from Allison, any new tests or scans for the detection of uh, neuroendocrine uh, NEC or NET? Yeah, so dotatate is the most recent one. Um, that was FDA approved about three years ago. It's I think more centers show or having availability for that. Um, we pair that PET scan with usually a, a, a CT scan, but for certain types of people, pairing it with an MRI scan is going to be more useful. And there's fewer centers that are capable of doing that, where we do a dotatate MRI. Um, there are some other uh, uh, agents that essentially use a different type of metal as the as the um, thing that glows on the scan. So we use something called gallium. There's one that's approved for copper. Um, I, I have not seen good evidence that, it, that they're any better. Um, so I think it, it's mostly a Coca-Cola, Pepsi question at this sure. point. Uh, Dr. Chen, I actually had a specific question uh, for you from Eva that says, do you require patients to have a gallium 68 prior to surgery? Uh, if, you, if not, do you have the pathologist check for uh, receptions at the time of biopsy, receptors probably. Re check for receptors at the time of the uh, biopsy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you so, require patients to have gallium 68 prior to surgery is the initial question. Yeah. So I think the, the broad answer to that would be no, but it would really depend on the circumstance of the patient. So for instance, the patient presents, uh, most of the time they'll present with a CT scan. And if the tumor appears to be contained and localized, we might decide to do surgery without getting the dotatate scan because we think that the disease is confined and um, CT scans are generally pretty sensitive. If there is a suspicion of um, metastatic disease, we may even choose to do the surgery first and get the dotatate afterwards because it's not gonna change our uh, recommendation to take out the primary tumor because so the imaging, the sequence doesn't always have to be imaging first, go to date, then surgery. It can be the opposite. Um, Bart, do you want to comment as well since you do a lot of the surgery for this too? Yeah, I, uh, I, yeah I'd, I'd say exactly the same thing. I think it's a very patient specific. It's not a, um, a cut and dry question. I think one of the other things too is how old is the patient? So if again, if this is somebody in their thirties and I'm very suspicious this is an inherited syndrome and I would wanna know, are there other sites of disease? So like the gentleman I just talked to, or I mentioned, um, when I got his scan, he actually had a second tumor that we never would have picked up on a, on a CAT scan that was in his neck. And because of that, and we caught it early, 
Um, I think we were able to avoid a very morbid operation that he would have lost function, a lot of the nerves off of his brainstem by just treating him with radiation. And then that's going to be the hope. So, you know, I think it, it's a very, uh, it's a very tailored thing. And it's also something that we're actively studying as a medical community on when to use it. I think if you look at our, our guidelines that we as a, as a physician community follow, um, the, the evidence for some of this is very low quality and we will continually revisit these recommendations um, every you know five years or so and say, well, is there better evidence? Should we, should we everybody who's had her an operation, should we follow them with dotatates every year? Is a CAT scan enough? Do you, does everybody need to have at least one? Should everybody get one before their operation? Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. So right now we're just tailoring it to each individual. Got it, got it. I can add to this. Um, so we know that 30% patients, new endocrine patients, do not express somatostatin receptors. So um, those patients uh, will not be positive for um, delta page imaging. Um, so, um, and also we know that um, patients have very heterogeneous uh, tumors, very heterogeneous nodules. So some nodules can express uh, SSTR2 for delta page imaging and some not. So we are working how to express, um, how to make those face patients eligible for, for delta page. But again, about 30% of neuroendocrine patients really will not show positivity with delta page. Got it, thank you for that. Um, I have a question. Uh, we've talked a lot about serotonin today. I have a question from uh, Rebecca that says, if you take medication that in increases serotonin like uh, Cymbalta, Will it cause NETs or cause them to increase? And uh, on the flip side of that, is there any medication that you should avoid if you're diagnosed with a NET uh, or a neuroendocrine carcinoma? So it, it, will something that elevates levels of serotonin have any effect on, on, it, on NETs? I, I have not seen any evidence that's the case. We think you know, these, these tumors are producing serotonin as a byproduct. I don't think that they are, that serotonin is driving their production. I don't think we have any evidence that that's the case. As far as medications to avoid, um, you know, niacin is the only thing I can think of just because it can cause flushing. Um, but I don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Got it. Thank you for that. And thanks, Rebecca, for your question. So earlier I had asked about kind of the, you know, what are we looking towards in the future? And Renata was talking about, um, you know, things to prevent metastases. Let's, let's flip that around and look back a little bit. I, you know, I had alluded to the, the, the leaps and bounds we seemingly have made in the past 10 years. What are those uh, areas of research that really put us in the situation where we're able to manage this disease like we are now in, in, in the past, in the past 10 years? Are there certain uh, studies that really, you know, push the needle significantly that you all can point to? So I think um, imaging and, and treatment again against SSTR2 receptors are the, the, the main uh, um, advantage. I think it was approved three years ago. And um, now we are trying to uh, improve and have more patients um, which can, can use this method. But I think this was the milestone uh, for imaging and, and treatment with Lutathera. Of course, we are looking and searching for new uh, receptors, um, and we we have a few candidates, and those receptors can be targeted um, specifically um, um, avoiding um, uh, hurt the organ with um, antibody drug conjugates nanoparticles. Uh, but uh, and some of them are even a clinical trial. But it's, it will be a little bit longer way. I think that that um, um, Dota page, so somatostatin analogs, and with Lutathera treatment, are the really milestone right now. Yeah, I think in the last decade there's been a number of big clinical trials. Um, there's the the ProMed and the Clarinet, which showed that these octreotide analogs, somat uh, the somatostatin analogs, octreotide and lanreotide, actually had some benefit in slowing the progression of these diseases. Um, there was the Radiant 4 trial that suggested that uh, Everolimus uh, could have a benefit. Uh, another trial for um, uh, Sunatinib or Sutin. 
And then most recently, the Netter 1 trial, which showed that there was a, a significant benefit uh, with Lutathera, which is a, a radiation treatment that targets these somatostatin receptors. Um, and for the first time, we actually saw, saw a shrinkage of these tumors by a significant degree over our standard therapy. So you know, I think we're really excited about that. It's a relatively new technology. Um, and I think long term, we need to understand better how uh, durable these responses are going to be. Can we give second rounds? If you had good response, if you get you start to get growth in two years, should we try again? Um, and I think there's a lot of different things that are unanswered about that, but it is very, very encouraging. Yeah, so I would say the sort of the three big things in my mind, which has led to us make advances over the last you know decade or more, is I would agree with the the work on somatostatin receptor and both from the imaging standpoint and Lutathera as a treatment. Uh, so much of our standard treatment involves you know agents targeting somatostatin and understanding that. I think there's more work to be done, like the work we're not is doing, trying to expand the number of patients that can have somatostatin-based therapies is one. I think two is, again, from my bias, I think we've made remarkable strides in surgery. Is today, we can do surgery much safer, uh, and so we offer surgery more. I think before mm -hmm. in the past, we were really tentative about using surgery as a treatment modality unless you were completely resectable, but now we take out the primary in the setting of metastatic disease. We debulk, we do things because we can do it safely. And um, so I think that's made a difference. And then third, I would just credit the patients because really our knowledge moving forward has been because patients have been willing to enroll in clinical trials to help us answer the questions. And so that's one I would think I would just put a big shout out to all patients with neuroendocrine cancers, their willingness to put, to go into trials more so perhaps than any other cancer that we have is that participate in trials to answer questions about what is going to be the next, the best therapy for future patients. And so I think the amount of trials that have been conducted in this space over the last decade have been remarkable. And again, due to patients willing to participate in. Absolutely. I was going to ask you to speak on that a little bit, like how important, because I know people are interested in clinical trials and maybe sometimes a little reticent or reluctant. Uh, so it seems like you're definitely a proponent and think that it's, it's beneficial for, for, for most patients. Yeah, I think, you know, I have a bias towards clinical trials because I do think clinical trials represent a lot of times the most cutting edge of therapies that are available. And it's one of the advantages when patients go to a comprehensive cancer center that they will have the ability to access those unique trials which aren't available anywhere. And, you know, as uh, Bart said, some of the breakthroughs we have had have been doing those trials and finding that the therapy is effective. And so those patients who enrolled in the trial got to get a therapy, not approved yet, but, um, had the great potential and probably had a, had that therapy had a good impact on their disease. Well, you had mentioned, you know, some of the new, uh, I don't know if you said techniques, but new approaches with uh, surgery. Could you, could you talk about that a little bit about it, some of the, the, the new ways you're using, sir, or we're able to use surgery more often now, or even, and, and potentially things that are, you know, new, new developments coming down the pipeline. Yeah, I think I should, when I'll talk about some more broad things and maybe ask Bart to, you know, talk a little bit about okay. the and the, but I think broadly, you know, field of surgery has gotten better, you know, anesthesia is safer. We tend to do more minimally invasive access procedures. We tend to do prehabilitation before surgery to get patients prepared for surgery so they recover faster uh, from the operation. Um, I think overall, when we deploy surgery right now, patients overall have a better outcome for whatever disease they have, obviously, including their endocrine. So I think that's been a remarkable um, advance in just the field of surgery. With regard to neuroendocrine cancer, I think using surgery more often, you know, doing techniques to maximize the chance that we can get a good resection, do it safely with minimal uh, risk or minimal complications, um, uh, 
has been a big effort. And then maybe Bart, you can comment a little bit about some of the innovative stuff around pancreas and GI surgery. Yeah, I, I would echo all that. I think um, the shift towards doing things minimally invasively has just made patient recovery much uh, faster. So I think it's, it's a less of a impact on their life. Um, and then the work that's done with the standardization of care around surgery. So something called enhanced recovery around surgery or ERAS, people may have heard of this, has really helped with moving people through and around the time of their operation to have um, very consistent outcomes and, and get back to life faster. And I think that's, you know, anytime we operate, we want to either make you, your life somehow live you, make you live longer, make you live better. And that's going to be the goal there. And so we don't want, there's an operation uh, that completely debilitates you is not going to be in your best interest. So I think we've gotten better at that. We've also gotten better We've as we've done more and we've had more time to look at how people have done after operations, we have learned more and we've learned more and say, okay, you know, before maybe operating on this patient population was not a good idea. At least that's what we thought. Well, it turns out that maybe it is. And so, you know, we learn more about patient selection, who's going to benefit from this operation, who won't. Um, and, and just like um, her mentioned, sometimes it makes sense to remove the, the intestinal tumor even though there may be spread disease in the liver. Sometimes it makes sense to remove some of the disease in the liver, even though you can't remove it all. And, and what we're learning now too is maybe even some of these people with incredibly aggressive cancers based on what it looks like under the microscope, something called a grade three tumor, um, where before we would not for an operation, some of those people, maybe we should be. And so I think there's a lot of these things that as time evolves and as patients participate in clinical trials and they're willing to, to work with us and really study this disease, we are getting better at, at helping people. Yeah. Uh, I have a comment from Linda says, NETS is certainly a very interesting uh, research disease. It sounds like very few cases can be identical, which uh, I, I, I would agree with that, even though I'm not an expert, but it brings up a bigger point. I know that, that, that all these cases are super unique. How challenging does that make your job when you're, when you're doing research that, you know, every case can potentially have its own path and not really replicate, uh, you know, the journey of another, of another case? So if I can start maybe with the cell line. So um, what, is, what is also the main limitation to look at the more patients uh, are uh, cell lines which uh, your endocrine cell lines, uh, which um, we are using. So right now we have just a few uh, cell lines and they're in the labs probably almost 30 years. So actually using those cell lines, probably we are studying only six, around six patients. So this is huge, huge limitation. And also um, we notice that those cell lines are changing um, when we are uh, culturing them. So this is really, really big um, uh, disadvantage. Um, what, what we do recently, um, uh, Bart and myself, we are trying to culture um, human tumors ex vivo and then treat those tumors in a special conditions with different drugs and look for uh, response um, for, for different treatments. So this is much, much easier than really, um, and, and actually it's more applicable, applicable than uh, using cell lines. Yeah, and I think, you know, these, um, the cell lines and there's a, these other things, these are what we call model systems, ways to study this disease outside of a human. And they could be just the cells from the tumor that were growing in a dish. They could be this ex vivo system that, that Renata helped develop called a bioreactor. They could be something called an organoid or a spheroid, or they could take a piece of your tumor and try to grow in the back of a mouse. And that's called a, a xenograft or PDX model. Um, there's a number of these different ways where we're trying to study this and neuroendocrine tumors have been particularly challenging to get good models for. There is an organization called pattern.org that's working on trying to get um, organoids uh, from patient tumors. And I'm starting to work with them. Um, these are trying to be grown out at um, Harvard um, institution called the Broad. And so that may be something if you're going to have a resection and you're interested in participating in research and maybe your local 
uh, surgeon is not participating in clinical trials, this is a way you could still participate by going to their website and signing up for it. And they would work with your local pathologist and surgeon to send a piece of your tumor to try to get one of these organoids to grow. And then that gives researchers like us new tools to try to figure out uh, how to treat this. Because like Renata said, we're really basing all of these early clinical idea, pre, what we call preclinical ideas around six patient cell lines that were derived 30 years ago that have been mutated so much over time, we don't even know how much they're like a real tumor anymore. Right. Absolutely. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for your question. And also, um, she, uh, Linda said this was a very great lunch and thanks for all the work you do. Um, we got just a few more minutes, folks. So maybe we'll try to get some rapid fire questions in quickly. Uh, Patty and a few other people had a question about what is there anything that we can pinpoint that causes nets to become aggressive? After five years, mine have quickly spread in the last six months to the chest area, bones, lungs, pectorals. Is there anything that that has been shown that you've seen that will cause that that jump in aggressiveness after five years of uh, kind of being sustainable? Um, you know, unfortunately, as people are on treatment, that that is the what we see happen. Unfortunately, and I don't know if it's because we're selecting for certain populations that are resistant to the medication that we're getting. Um, and then those that are left behind or become more aggressive, or if there's an additional genetic mutation that occurs, I think it's probably a combination of both. Um, what exactly is that driver mutation? I don't think we know. Herb, you had some thoughts? Well, it goes back to my initial idea of dormancy is right now tumors, when we treat them, obviously, if they come back, there are certain cells that have survived that treatment, right? And they find a way to evade. And so where it looks like when we're giving a treatment that the tumor is shrinking, we're not completely eradicating. And those last tumor cells that sit there, many people believe are in, then are the ones that sort of wake up and go crazy because they found a way to evade therapy. So I think work today including work of ours focuses on understanding how those few cells survive. And then if we understand how they survive perhaps and we can find a way to effectively kill them at the first instance we're treating them so they can't uh, then blow up and progress. And so I think the next, you know, five to 10 years, I believe we'll have a better understanding of that. And hopefully then, you know, can, uh, find effective ways to either prevent that from happening or treat it, you know, when it happens. Got it. Uh, well, I just want to share one comment with you all. Kathy says, this has been the most informative luncheon yet. Thanks to all of you. So uh, that makes me very happy. And Kathy, that's what, what we're here for. And I think that's a perfect time uh, to close out today's session on that, on that high note. Um, thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us today. I really appreciate you, you coming in and giving us the, uh, this unique pr presentation. I'm appreciate and grateful uh, for all the work that you do. Thank you. It's thanks for having us. Absolutely. Uh, and thanks to you all at home for joining us. As always, we hope this program helped uh, answer some of your questions. And if you have follow up questions or we weren't able to get to your question, I encourage you to reach out to the Carcinoma Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page, you can send them a private message or at their website, carcinoid.org. And just so you know, you can always refer back to the video here on the videos tab that will live here and you can watch it again if you need to. Starting Monday, we will post it to YouTube for anyone you know who doesn't have Facebook if they'd like to see it as well. Well, thanks as always to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, this program wouldn't be possible. My name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thanks for watching and please join us next time for Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.